Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the regularly scheduled meeting of the uh, Vacaville Unified School District Board of Trustees. On behalf of the board, what uh, few there are of us tonight, we have a few out sick. We welcome you and look forward to a very uh, productive meeting. Before we get going, just a couple safety reminders. Uh, we got a lot of folks in here, so if we do have a, an emergency tonight, we have an exit straight behind you out to the hallway and make a right, or preferably, if possible, on each side of the dais, we have one as well. If we do have a medical emergency, we have an automatic uh, external defibrillator available behind the front counter. So someone on the far end will have to go get it, and we'll go from there if we need it. All right. Uh, with that, I'd like to go ahead and start with a moment of re reflection. <laughs> All right, and uh, next we'll do the Pledge of Allegiance. Uh, Dr. Shamia, will you lead us? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, um, Dr. Shmi, any changes to the agenda? No changes, President Jensen. Thank you. No changes. Uh, do I have a, a motion to uh, pass tonight's agenda? Uh, motion by uh, Mr. Windham, second uh, by Mr. Silva. Uh, all in favor? Uh, student board advisory votes. All in favor? Yes. Fantastic. Board member votes. Yes. All in favor? Yes. Passing unanimously. Thank you. I'm um, going to report on closed uh, session actions that we took care of. The um, board approved a confidential settlement agreement uh, by a roll call vote of 4-0 with uh, Mr. Kitsis, Ms. Malberg, and Mrs. Stacy uh, absent due to an illness. Okay. Item number 10, uh, consideration of student expulsion cases. Uh, recommended action that the board approved the recommendations for the following student discipline cases. We have two cases tonight, uh, 09-1920EX and 10-1920EX. I'll make the motion. Oh. Uh, uh, motion by Dally, second by Wyndham. Um, Is everybody on? Okay, Mr. Wyndham, your vote, please. Yes. Mr. Silva? Yes. Mrs. Dowley? Yes. And Mr. Jansen? Yes. yes. Thank you. Uh, item 12, which is going to be student and staff recognition. Uh, item 12A, Browns Valley School student recognition. Looks like we have uh, teachers Carrie Stein and Stephanie Bracken will recognize our students from uh, Browns Valley, outstanding students. There we are. I gotta get rid of this. Come on up, Sarah. Okay, and before we get into this formal, if your parents, friends, or anything, and you want to take pictures, come stand right here between the two of us. Take as many photos that you want. There's no problem at all. We'll, we'll take you up here. There you go. There's a taker. Fant come on right up here. Yep. My name's Stephanie Bracken. I'm a sixth grade teacher at Browns Valley Elementary School, and I have the honor to um, recognize Sarah Mix here for our student of the year for fourth through sixth. Sarah Mix is recognized tonight because she is an exemplary student and role model to her peers, younger students, and her siblings. She's the oldest of six kids. She is kind, helpful, and has an incredible outlook at all times. She comes in with a smile, is ready to learn, and nothing stands in her way every single day. What more can a teacher ask for? 
She helps outside of school for any event the school may have, whether it is donating, set up, clean up, participating, or help organizing. She is there. She is responsible and faces any new challenge with confidence and ease. She uses her resources to help support her and guide her. Sarah listens to every single instruction and helps whenever she can or is asked to help anyone who needs it. Her tolerance is inspiring. She is a true representation of everything our school and mission stands for. I am so lucky to be her teacher, and um, I look forward to see how she just dominates the future. Congratulations, Sarah. Hi, my name is Carrie Stein. I'm a second grade teacher at Browns Valley Elementary, and I recommended Ellie Bracken for Browns Valley's Primary Student of the Year because not only is Ellie an amazing and hardworking student, she's actually one of the kindest, most thoughtful children I've ever had the pleasure of teaching. Ellie is always willing to put in extra time to make sure her assignments are completed with 100% effort. Ellie has also earned her PhD in accelerated reader points, <laughs> earning over 40 points already this year, and this is a really big deal in second grade. <laughs> Ellie's compassionate personality makes others feel appreciated and acknowledged. She comes to school every day with a huge smile and an excitement for learning. Ellie's new to Browns Valley this year, but you would never know it. She has made it her mission to get to know as many students and staff as she can. If anyone is having a bad day, or hard day or struggling, Ellie will be the first one there to offer support. She brings so much joy to everyone around her. Mrs. Cook, our school librarian, said it best one day when she said that Ellie is sunshine, and she really is. Congratulations, Ellie. You are truly deserving of this honor. Congratulations to both of you, Ellie and Sarah. Great job. You should be proud of yourself. <clears throat> Item 12B, recognition of the uh, Certificated Employees of the Year. Our Director of uh, Human Resources, Manolo Garcia, will present. Well, thank you very much. Uh, it gives me a great honor. This is one of my favorite things to do uh, around this time of year. We get to recognize the teachers of the year from our various school sites. Staff members, administration from each of those school sites get to select uh, and honor their teacher of the year from their school sites. So uh, it's my privilege to get to do that this evening. Uh, and what I'd like uh, just procedurally is for, as I call uh, the teachers' names, for them to come over and stand to my left and remain up here. Uh, we're going to take some photos at the end. So we also have something that um, our superintendent, Shamia, is going to provide to you. All right? So without further ado, I'd like to invite up here Stuart Russell, Alamo Elementary.
from Browns Valley, kindergarten classroom teacher, Charmaine Lee. <laughs> kindergarten teacher from Cooper Elementary, Pam Wilcox. Fairmont Charter Elementary, speech therapist, Andre Andrea Forrest. <laughs> From Hemlock Elementary, third grade teacher, Shannon Garner. From Edwin Markham Elementary, second grade teacher, Margaret Sue Vincenti. From Orchard Elementary, fifth grade classroom teacher, Allison Epperson. From Eugene Payton Elementary, SDC Transitional Kinder Kindergarten teacher, Deborah Debbie Kavanaugh. <laughs> so right where you are, just take a few steps forward and, and do a 180, perfect. <clears throat> All right, Sierra Vista K-8 school, uh, English teacher, life skills teacher, and intro to art, Anthony Miranda. <laughs> From Willis Jepson Middle School, science teacher Bonnie Coldiron. From Country High School, study skills teacher Stacy Smith. <laughs> From Ernest Kimmy Charter Academy math teacher Kaylee. <laughs> Tolliver, thank you. <laughs> Not as it's spelled. From Vacaville High School, math and economics teacher Nick Oman. <laughs> From Wilsey Wood High School, chemistry teacher Michaela Waugh. <laughs> and from our Vacaville Adult School, adult ESL teacher, Joy Holleran. Okay. And from Vacapina, Michelle Wright Vargas. So we have one more announcement and one last school to announce. And this one is um, particularly special. Uh, from this illustrious group, we get to select one teacher that moves on to the county competition and is the representative of Vacaville Unified School District. And this year, it is none other than Kay Nakoda from Callison Elementary. <laughs> So 
One more round of applause for this amazing group of educators. All right, <clears throat> we'll go ahead and continue. That was perfect for this weekend. That was like announcing the starting lineup for the Super Bowl right there, <laughs> right? No wonder our kids are so successful and, you, and uh, thank you for trusting us with your kids because we have teachers like that and the rest of our staff to make them very successful. So with that, we'd like to hear from one of our schools tonight and uh, we have Principal Lynn Benavides who's gonna provide a report on the Browns Valley Elementary School. You got your team? got the team? All right. And welcome. We're going to sit, yeah. I'm going to have him just sit right there. <laughs> And parents, again, if you want to come up here and cheat and get photos, please do. Good evening, President Jansen, members of the board, and Superintendent Shamia. I am Lynn Benavides, the principal of Browns Valley Elementary School. It is an honor for Mrs. White and I to stand in front of you and share all the things that makes Browns Valley an amazing learning community. One of the socially emotional components we have started this school year is focusing on mindfulness. Inner Explorer is a series of daily five to 10 minute audio guided mindfulness practices. The program focuses on key areas of development, bringing mindfulness to education and helping students prepare for learning. Daily practices teach students the practical techniques to appropriately handle difficult emotions such as stress, anxiety, anger, and more. We would like to start our presentation by sharing with you how we start our day at Browns Valley. I would like to welcome Mrs. Lee's kindergarten class to lead us in our Inner Explorer program. Stand in front. Sit in your spot, a comfortable spot. Relax. Relax. 
Hi, it's Will. Let's begin by doing the shark fin as you listen to the chimes. Do you remember how? Place your thumb on your forehead with your fingers pointing up. Then, moving your hand slowly down the middle of your face as your hand passes your eyes, closing them. And as it moves past your mouth and towards your heart, saying, shh, as softly as you can. As a reminder of the five S's, sitting straight, still, silently, softly breathing and shut eyes. And now, keeping your hand on your heart and repeating to yourself, I have the power, I have the power to make wise choices. Make wise choices. Beginning to settle down wherever you're sitting. Maybe on a chair or on the floor. Breathing in. Breathing out. <coughs> breathing in. And out. In. And out. Today, we'll practice watching our thoughts. Did you know that everyone has lots of thoughts? All the time. Sometimes we are thinking about how our body feels. Maybe we are uncomfortable sitting. Or maybe we have an itch. As you breathe in <coughs> and out. Trying to notice what you're thinking about right now. Maybe you're thinking about what I'm saying. No matter what you're thinking, it's perfectly fine. Sometimes we play a little game. If we have a thought, we pretend it's floating on a cloud, and we watch that cloud float by. Maybe you're wondering how long you have to sit with your eyes closed. Or maybe about playing with a friend or sibling after school. As soon as you have a thought, pretending it's floating away on a big fluffy cloud. The thought about playing after school is resting on the cloud and floating away. Then you just take another breath in and out <coughs> until the next thought comes. When we notice our thoughts, it helps us not to get too worried about them. You know what? Some of the thoughts we have aren't even true. Some of them we can just let go of. And now, opening our eyes and singing the exploring song together. <laughs> when I look up, I see the whole world shine. When I look down, I feel the earth as mine. When I look out, I touch everything. When I look in, I can hear my heart sing. Say the one more time. When I look up, shine when i look down i feel the earth as mine when i look
explore with me. I'd like to invite Mrs. Lee up to talk a little bit about the program used in her classroom. Good evening. It's a great pleasure to have this opportunity to share my Inner Explorer experiences with you. As you've heard at Brown Valley, we start our day the Inner Explorer way. And if I happen to get distracted or somehow swept up in our daily routine without starting with Inner Explorer, I'm sure that doesn't happen to anybody else, but they will make sure we get on track and start it. It's something they have looked forward to and embraced wholeheartedly since we started this year. I have two stories, I'll make them quick, uh, that happen, I'll bridge what's here, uh, that really demonstrate how my class has embraced Inner Explorer. The first one was a spontaneous application out on the playground where I had a, um, a friend fall off the monkey bars and two of her compassionate classmates brought her on over to me. She was covered in bark. And they started to tell me the long version of what just happened on the playground. And the student who fell was covered with bark and clearly shaken. So I thanked the girls for bringing her over. And I asked her, the student who fell, if she was really hurt or if she was just more scared. And she said, luckily, that she was not hurt. So I asked the friends what they thought they could do to help her friend feel better. And so I said, do you think you could brush her off, get a drink of water, take a little rest? And the friend uh, who said this is sitting here tonight, and she said, let's get a drink of water and do some shark fins. And the three of them went over to the drinking fountain, got their drink of water, sat down, and shh, their little selves, they brushed her off, they got up, and they left. Problem was solved, everybody was okay, emotions were settled, and it was phenomenal. My second story I'll make super quick. It's daily, and there are several friends sitting here who do this daily. Kindergarten's a challenge. It's not just, you know, graham crackers and milk anymore. And I have friends who initiate their own mini shark fin during the day when they're asked to do something that is either academically challenging, socially challenging. They'll sit there, and they, their little thumb just kind of goes down their nose, and you can just see them. They go, shh, shh, shh. And it works. And it's really, really great for my kids. So um, sometimes when I see them frustrated, I might ask, do you think some shark fins will help? And without fail, every time, they're willing to just buy in and get going and, and breathe. And I think that's what a lot of us do. It's like, you just got to breathe sometimes. And they are amazing. So that's, that's my day. That's my way. They're the ladybugs. And I think they're fabulous. So thank you for letting me share this with you. There are two young ladies who are going to step up. I'd like to invite Avery and Iris to come on up to present about Browns Valley Paws. My name is Avery and I will be talking about our Browns Valley Paws. Browns Valley students follow our paws. P is practice responsibility, A is act kindly, W is work hard, and S is stay safe. When students follow our paws, they can get bear bucks or a good news referral. Both of these can add up to rewards at school. If you receive 10 bear bucks or one good news referral, you can choose to go to our new bear den during recess. The bear den is full of fun games, Legos, art supplies, a foosball table, an air hockey table, a Nintendo Wii, and even a pool table. Hello, my name is Iris. Students are recognized by their teachers during our awards assemblies for their academic excellence and improved behavior while in the classroom. Mrs. Benavidez and Mrs. White celebrate attendance, achievement, and students who show positive character at school. Each month has a character education fo focus, like this month is caring. We talk about what it means to be caring, times we have been caring, and what ways we can show caring at school and at home. It is nice to talk about it as a class so we can hear ideas from other people in, in class. Next we have Kenneth and Talon who will be talking about growth mindset. Hi, my name is Kenneth and I'm going to be talking about growth mindset and the power of yet. Growth mindset is you telling yourself that you can do this. You just have to remember, mistakes are good. Every time you get something wrong, you learn from it. And you have to understand your brain is just like a muscle and that you have to train it. At my school, we had a rapper named Blake Madness come and talk to us about the power of yet. 
He said that when you cannot do something, it's not that you can't do it, it's just that you can't do it yet. He explained that when he was younger, he pushed himself down because he was not good at rapping, but he told himself, I just can't do this yet. And by having this growth mindset, he was able to make it onto America's Got Talent. Now I'd like to introduce Talent, who's going to teach us a little something we learned at our Growth Mindset Assembly. Hi, my name is Talon, and I'd like to share with you a little something we learned at the Growth Mindset Assembly. I'd like to ask all of you to try beatboxing with me. Beatboxing sounds like something that is too hard to learn, but we are all going to learn to beatbox together. All you have to do is say the words boots and cats, and we will begin to speed up the words to make it sound like beatboxing. Now try it with me, everyone. Ready? Boots and cats and 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 boots and cats. All right. Great job, everybody. See, it does not matter how old you are, you can always learn something new if you keep a growth mindset. I think growth mindset and the power of yet is very important and it made a change at our school. Next, we have Caden and Micah who will be talking about student leadership. Thank you, Talon. My name is Micah and I am the president of student leadership at Browns Valley. And I want to share with you the great opportunities that are available for our students. We help with events put together by our PTO, like Breakfast with Santa, Harvest Festival, Papa with PTO, and the Fred Run, which is our biggest fundraiser ever at BV. We raised over $26,000 for our school. Student leadership gives ki kids the chance to be the voice for their classmates. It brings in kids that never thought they could be leaders. They get a chance to help make decisions that keep students wanting to come, come to school every day. Now I'd like to introduce Katie Wayne. Thank you, Micah. My name is Kaden, and I am the Vice President of Leadership at Browns Valley. The student leadership is amazing at Browns Valley. Students do a lot of things for the school. We collected food for the back of fish. We help families at our school by doing the giving tree to, to collect gifts for students at our school who are less fortunate. We help with POP and PTO every Friday in order to raise money for playground equipment. We also supported our newest event, the Holiday Breakfast. We are looking forward to helping with future activities like Career and College Day, Authors Week, Kindness Week, Loved Ones Breakfast, and my favorite, Field Day. This is what makes Mounds Valley a great school to be at. Now let me hand it off to Cameron Holbein and Ethan Busby to tell you other ways why BV is great. Thank you, guys. <clears throat> my name is Ethan. I'm going to tell you you what makes Browns Valley great? What makes Browns Valley great? I think BV is great because of its atmosphere. When I'm in BV, I always feel safe. I am never left out and always included in a game or activity. In the class, the kids are always working and not messing around too much. <laughs> Having my friends in the class makes the six hours go by fast. Cameron would also like to share with you what he thinks makes Browns Valley great. Thank you, Ethan. My name is Cameron. I think Browns Valley is great because of the amazing activities. The teachers are outstanding and always helping us with anything we are stuck on. In class, the kids are always helpful with their other classmates and willing to learn and participate in more challenging activities. Our principals make all these fun things possible for us, and that's why I think BB is great. Enough about us. Let's get to what our students think about Browns Valley. Many students think Browns Valley is great because of our field day, talent show, the dances, and the famous Harvest Festival. We don't just host school events. The teachers include a bunch of grade level activities. In sixth grade, we have an egg drop, STEM day. We visited the Egyptian Museum and had a campus tour of San Jose State University. Every day is an adventure at Browns Valley. It makes a year go by fast. These events keep the students on their feet and always having fun. Besides the amazing principals and staff, the students really make BV the best. Now I'll introducing Mrs. Benavides and Mrs. White, so grab your pillows because this is going to be a long one. <laughs> Hard to follow that. The Browns Valley Dashboard created by the California School Dashboard provides a snapshot of our progress as of fall 2019. Chronic absentees is 3.9%. The school suspension rate is 1.3%.
4.3% of our student population are English language learners. This year, we are very excited that we are reclassifying eight of our English language learning students, and we continue to celebrate that 76.7% .7 of our English language learning students increased by one or more levels on the LPAC. English language arts progress has increased by 5.8 points, and in mathematics, we maintained our level. This data will be broken down in the future slides. These are the CAS results for English language arts spanning from the 2016 to 2019 school year. In 2016, 42% of our students met or exceeded standards in English language arts. Students who met or exceeded English language arts standards in 2019 reached 60%. This is an 18% increase in proficiency over the four years. Scores are 11% higher than the state average in English language arts. In order to increase the number of students who have met or exceeded standards in English language arts, we have made a change in our response to intervention program. We hired a reading specialist who provides tier three targeted intervention to our students in kindergarten through fifth grade and providing coaching to our teaching staff. A tier two intervention program implemented by the classroom teachers also provides targeted support to students who are in need of intervention services. Through continuous progress monitoring, we are seeing growth in students who were below grade level in reading. We are also focusing on first good teaching strategies. I'd like to introduce Mrs. White. Good evening. My name is Tracy White, and I'm the assistant principal at Browns Valley Elementary School. These are our CASP math results beginning in 2016 and continuing through 2019. In 2016, 38% of our students were uh, met or exceeded standards in math. This past year, 45% of our third through sixth grade students exceeded or met standards in math. Uh, this is a 7% increase uh, in proficiency over the past four years. To continue growth in the area of math, we've implemented an intervention period built into our master schedule, focusing on number sense, number talks, and struggle problems. We have provided professional development to staff in each of these areas as well, uh, as data analysis and targeted math intervention. We also use Dreambox Intervention and Khan Academy to help close those math gaps um, for our students at Browns Valley. Attendance is of high importance at Browns Valley. We have created an environment in which students, staff, and families feel connected. The daily attendance rate at Browns Valley for the 2016-2017 school year was 94.5%. In 2017-2018, that rate went up to 97.3%. In the last year, 2018-2019, we ended with a daily attendance rate of 96.1%. Our current attendance rate is 96.2%, and we're working on it every single day. Building relationships with families has increased the connections necessary for students and families to make school a priority in their daily lives. Our continued focus on building long-lasting relationships within our school community has allowed us to decrease negative behaviors while increasing positivity and attendance for students, staff, and families at Browns Valley. We are very excited to share that our behavior referrals have declined in the last three years with the most significant drop of last year, which was a 28% drop in referrals. This is a reduction of over 90 behavior referrals. Browns Valley continues to implement a positive behavior intervention and support system, also known as PBIS, with a focus on positive behavior and celebrating student success. Through the use of school-wide rewards, which our wonderful two ladies shared with us, which are our Bear Bucks, Good News Referrals, Pause Award Ceremony, and our newest positive rewards room, uh, fondly known as the Bear Den at school. This year, we are using a new school-wide communication app that's called Hangout. This program allows teachers, administration, the mental health clinician, and all additional support staff to send real-time behavior concerns through a messaging app. We are able to provide instant support to all staff and students, which decreases the number of students sent out of the classroom. This free app streamlines communication and increases instructional minutes for students while managing behavior. We look forward to a continued reduction in behavior referrals at Browns Valley Elementary for this 2019-2020 school year. And thank you all for your time tonight. I am done, yes. Let's step up for questions. You notice how she made me come up here for questions. Yeah. <laughs> I, I don't see any. Okay, but here we go. 
great job on your numbers, right? The right numbers are going up, the, the other numbers are going down. So it's showing that you and your team are doing a great job. But I'd like to throw some kudos out to Avery, Iris, Kenneth, Tyler, Micah, Caden, Cameron, and Ethan for um, your presentations. It takes a lot to stand up, especially in front of a group of people like this. And you guys did a fantastic job. So uh, keep up the good work. And with that, thank you very thank much you, for your presentation. Oh, hold on. What? No, I, re I rejected you. Rejected you. I rejected you. <laughs> okay, you're go. good. Go. I just want to say that um, I know that the social emotional part of a school is what makes it the culture, and it sounds like you're doing a great job. I think that exercise that the kids are doing, what a way to focus and give them some other tool. And I think many of the adults here are probably going, I should try. <laughs> I'm thinking. I'm so thank you for implementing something that I think those children will carry with them for a long time. And in our society today, I think we need to teach people how to be less anxious and more calm, et cetera. So thank you for all of that. And um, congratulations on your school being a happy place. With sunshine. Yeah. Right? Thank you. Right. Great. Thank you. Good. What's that? Oh, your clicker? Okay. Good night, everybody. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. Not you, staff. You have to stay. <laughs> You ready? ready? I am ready. Okay. All right. Time for uh, superintendent's comments and correspondence. Good Jane. evening, board members, student board reps. Good evening, everybody. Um, over the past couple weeks, I've had some time to visit classrooms, of course, which I love to do. Uh, Mr. Silva um, spent a couple days with me visiting classrooms. And I also spent a couple hours recently with um, city council member Ray Beatty, visited three schools. Um, starting at Callison, and um, when I go into a classroom, one of the things I look for more than anything is student engagement, and that's been a big focus in the district. A lot of conversations with principals, with teachers about student engagement and what that looks like. We can see Kay Nakoda, uh, who just got the honor of Teacher of the Year. She has the ability to engage all students any grade level, um, when we talk about student engagement, it means a variety of different types of lessons. Uh, Mr. Bozzini is giving his students some time to practice what they learned in their math silos, but math also obviously involves some hands-on. This is Ms. Green at Callison doing a really creative fraction lesson combined with an art. Again, a lot of student engagement different ways to learn the same thing. And math really has been a focus as well as student engagement in our district. But we, of course, we're also focusing a lot on writing as well. This is um, a reading intervention. Casey Ramos is, I think, fairly new to the district. She is our response to intervention teacher. And every time I go to school site, I always try to take time to check on the intervention because that's addressing the students who um, need a little extra help. And she did this great lesson on writing where she started with a short video to inspire the students, gave the students the opportunity to talk about what they saw, gave them a writing assignment, but gave them two different choices on what to write on. Again, empowering students that way is another great example of student engagement and giving them opportunities to talk, see a short video, moving activities along. 
is a great student engagement activity. And you can tell by the picture, <laughs> Ms. Thompson, Thomas's class is one of the busiest classes I think I've ever seen. She has students always engaged, focused. They were doing some makeup work, but every stu single student in that classroom were focused and working on something, and they were second grade and working independently, and that's a lot for second grade students. But my favorite part about Callison was the dancing. So I didn't know this. I was quite impressed and surprised that every Friday they have a volunteer from the Sheriff's Department that plays music and dances with the students. And they fall along, and yes, that's uh, Miss Reed, the principal, who jumped in and joined in the dancing. And to me, I mean, it's not just dancing. It's really good for the brain to have to follow steps along, but it's also great for students to get engaged in things at recess because they have a tendency not to get into conflicts, and when they get back to class, they're a lot calmer and ready to focus. It was a lot of fun to watch, actually. Um, Mr. Silva and I, among other many schools we went to, we visited Sierra Vista and bumped into these fourth graders who were engaged in their community service project, which is recycling. Uh, Sierra Vista has a requirement for all, for all grades to have a community service component. And these students were really proud and proud of their vests that identified their community service fourth grade group. Uh, Sierra Vista has two amazing kindergarten teachers. They were both working on math, and math is a little different in kindergarten these days. They don't just learn their numbers. They're actually adding and subtracting. And both kindergarten teachers, they must collaborate very well together because they were at the same time working on the same activity. And they're not just learning adding and subtracting, they're cutting and pasting, which is great for fine motor skills for kindergarten. Again, more student engagement. Um, Ms. Doss, fourth grade teacher at Sierra Vista, has her tablet hooked up to her smart board, which enables her to circle the room while she's teaching math so she can work with students, intervene, make sure they're engaged and paying attention. And Ms. Horsley, of course, is another outstanding teacher at Sierra Vista who made great use of her smart board in math. And again, we focused for the past two years on math because it is a new a type of way of teaching. It's not the way we've all learned math. It's part of the new Common Core. And our teachers are pretty amazing um, when we go and watch the way they're teaching it and the way the students are learning it. And when I was visiting with Mr. Beatty, we went to Wilsey Wood and we saw some CTE courses and I dropped by Ms. Hensley's math class. Ms. Hensley is a phenomenal math teacher. And she mentioned to me that she's been doing our online videos that we offer to teachers as professional development. So we've been doing a lot of professional development in math, but not just where teachers come in and learn, but we've also given them the opportunity to do videos at home. And Joe Bowler is a really well-known math expert educator, and she ties good learning in math to brain research. And Brenda Hensley shared with me that she's so inspired and so excited about what she learned from those videos that it's changed her teaching. And that was kind of give me chills because she's been teaching a long time and she's a great teacher. So somebody who's already a great teacher willing to grow and learn and get excited was just really inspiring for me. And speaking of teachers of the year, Mr. Omond was the VACA High Teacher of the Year. I went and visited him. I wasn't really familiar with him. And he kind of blew my mind. <laughs> he was teaching AP economics, not an easy topic. I wanted to stay because I learned a lot in like the 15, 20 minutes I was in the room. He did every great teaching strategy to engage students. He had the whiteboards with students showing answers. He was going through problems having students share with each other, talk about the problems. He even has students regularly get up and give the update of the day. It was just a great classroom to be in. It was so much fun to watch him. So this is just a sampling 
of our amazing teachers, but when we talk about student engagement, we're seeing it in our students. It's great visits. And lastly, to switch the topic a little bit, I just want to congratulate Juan Cordon once again. Our director of child nutrition got another grant. I don't know if it's his third or fourth one. He gets it through the California Department of Education, $99,000. Um, and it's a very specific grant. So Country High and Payton will be able to purchase a food service bar. And Vaca Pena will get a combination oven and a dishwasher. Yes. So this is part of the ongoing upgrades of our um, all of our kitchens. And as Juan said, he said, somebody must really like me at the Department of Ed because I get these grants quickly and easily. And of course, my response is, how could anybody not like Director Juan, right? <laughs> and that concludes my report. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Jane, one question. <laughs> no. Oh, nice. Yes. Yeah. Sorry, you don't have to clap for me. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Only clap for the kids and okay. the teachers. I didn't see any pictures of you dancing. Did you not join the kids and, and lead by example? I, and I, I wanted to, because I actually really like to dance, but. Next time. Wow. High heels and all, you know, next oh, yeah, time. Okay. Yeah. All right, well, come dressed prepared next time, all right? <laughs> Very good. All right, board member comments and correspondence. Do we have any? Oh, hold on a second. <clears throat> We're gonna go, Shelly, you first. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say that I learned something about our library that I thought uh, everybody should know, that if you go to the website for the library, there's on the right-hand side is a column, and if you go to the Discover and Go, you can actually get um, passes for museums and um, science centers and zoos and other cultural destinations, like two-for-one to the Steinhardt Aquarium, things like that. And you just put your library card in, and you have to be over 18, or over 15, I can't remember the age, you have to go to the site and find it out. But I was very excited to see that because I know that we really believe in going out into the community and beyond with kids and families and it gets very expensive nowadays. So to have something for our library system that can cut the cost, I thought we need to spread the word on that. So that's all I wanted to say. All right, perfect, Mr. Silva. Yeah, just um. Uh, th there'll be an announcement for uh, my fellow board members, but um, the Solano County School Board Association on uh, April 20th, our topic's gonna be how uh, local policies at the city, county, and state level influence student achievement. So um, if you're looking forward uh, to a series of engaging discussions on uh, how policies um, influence what uh, what uh, is always a challenge for our, um, our district to to um, to manage in order to make sure our students have a good education. I uh, highly encourage you all to come out, uh, participate, <laughs> contribute, and learn. Thank you. So April 20th, April 20th, 6 p.m. to be determined place. <laughs> <laughs> all right, any more? All right, seeing that, we'll go to the student board representative meet, uh, reports, and we'll start with uh, Via Calderon from Buckingham Charter. Do you want to pass that down? There we go. There you go. Good. We're These past few weeks have been very eventful at Buckingham. For starters, we had our yearly blood drive today and we were able to have over 40 successful donations. We are also collecting donations for our Days for Girls Drive in which we collect feminine products and bring them to young girls in Africa in the beginning of February. We are also sell currently selling our Valentine Grams, which is a yearly fundraiser. We also finished our theater production of Ad Adam's Family, which ended very successfully. And this week, our academic decathlon team will, com will be competing in a speech competition at Solano this Saturday. In athletics this week, our varsity basketball teams had a home game at Cristo Rey on ma Monday, January 27th. On Wednesday, January 29th, our soccer teams had an away game at Delta High. And today, January 30th, our soccer teams have a home game at, at Encina High. Excellent. Thank you very much. Jeff, all yours. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jeff Garcia. I'm the school representative for Country High, and I will begin to read my report. 
The students at Country High School want to congratulate Stacy Smith for being selected as Teacher of the Year. This week is National Kindness Week and Country High School is participating in the Great Kindness Challenge. Each day of the week, there have been activities and messages all about showing kindness. On Monday, students receive cards with five simple acts of kindness samples, as well as complimenting candy to give to someone along with the compliment. Tuesday, we're showing kindness through grad gratitude for our com campus supervisor, John, and custodian, Karen. This is giving, wait, uh, they were given a card signed by the students and each received a cake baked by food classes. Students were encouraged to show their gratitude by cleaning up their cell, cleaning after them, themselves and getting to class on time. Wednesday was kindness there and videos about kindness and positive messages to social media accounts. Today was uh, reflecting on acts of kindness someone has done for us with the kindness chain. Tomorrow we'll focus on kindness towards ourselves with health, healthy lunch choices. Signs are posted around campus reading, re reminding students about easy ways to spread kindness. And some students from the English classes are working on personal narratives and uh, personal narratives about when someone showed student kindness. We have our quarterly advisory yesterday. Students met with their teachers to discuss about indiv individual transcripts and credit production. Oh, that's my slide. <laughs> this is an opportunity to reflect on goal sets and previous quarter and set quarter goals for the new quarter. In advisory, students also do planning for post high school goals. The office takes this information to set guest speakers and experiences for the students. Our honor roll event will be on Thursday, February 6th at 5.30 p.m. This is a great time for students, parents, and staff members to have a great meal and to celebrate student achievements. This event is open to all students and, have a, and has a great turnout every year. We would like to thank the staff for donating in the items to make this event happen. Thank you, Ms. Martin. Very good, nice job, Jeff. Thank you very much. Gabby Salazar, Vacaville High. Good evening, board members. Good evening. Um, to start off, I would like to give congratulations to our December tireless teacher, Ms. Kirowitz. On January 17th, we had a celebrato celebratory lunch for last year's 107 AP Scholar Award winners in the library. This week's Senior of the Week is Owen Castillo. Um, this week's Student of the Week is Elena De Los Reyes. This week's Athlete of the Week is Myron Amy or MJ. This week's Artist of the Week is Vicki Lee. Tonight we have a boys basketball and boys soccer game at Armeo. Tomorrow we have a girls basketball home game against Armeo starting at 5.30 to 7. Coming up soon we have a, our powder puff football game, juniors versus seniors, hopefully juniors win, <laughs> and an all-male drill team to support our girls during the day. Today and Friday, representatives from Census Bureau will be on our campus during lunch. They came in order to answer students' questions and provide, provide information on how to apply for a job with the 2020 Census. February 7th, we are hosting our first blood drive of this year. Shockingly, we only have around 10 spots left for students to sign up with only a few, like one week left. February 11th and 12th, we have our spring club fair. All the clubs on our campus have an opportunity to recruit new members and broadcast new activities. Thursday, February 14th, we have our winter rally. And Friday, February 15th, this is our black and blue basketball game against Wood. For upcoming events in April and May, April 9th is the date for our this year's morph. The theme is Astro World. And May 1st is the date for our Ye this year's Mr. GQ pageant with the theme Bachelor. Thank you. All right, Gabby, thank you very much. Uh, Rayanne West, Wilshire Wood. Good evening, everyone. Sorry, I'm a little scratchy voice, so just bear with me for a little bit. So within the past four weeks, Wilshire Wood has been very busy. Uh, right after our last meeting, we had our annual winter ball, which was held at the Ulata Center. Um, everyone looked absolutely amazing. I hope it's a night to remember for them. 
So on Tuesday, we just had our annual Red Out basketball game, which is to support the American Heart Association. Our service leadership program did an amazing job decorating the gym, offering fun activities, and raising money for the association. Our boys team did a great job of keeping the spirits up when they were playing Fairfield High, and they took home the win, so that was pretty amazing. Um, as well as our basketball team, our soccer teams have been doing amazing so far. If the boys team win their game tonight, which fingers crossed they did, they'll be on the top of their leaderboard in our league. So. Our link crew has been working very, very hard on our upcoming Kindness Week, a week focused on giving back in many different kinds of ways to many different groups of people. Each day of the week has a main focus. Monday will be kindness, Tuesday is peace, Wednesday is caring, Thursday is family, and Friday, Valentine's Day, is love. And like every other year, we're having our um, Kindness Week rally, which will also be on Friday. And we would love if you guys came. We will be giving out so many amazing gifts to people who deserve them, who've been working so hard. And we just want to show that we really do love our Wildcat family, both the students, the staff members, and their families. And additionally to our Kindness Week, our leadership has started breaking off into multiple teams to start preparing for a semester full of events, including our annual car show. We invite you know, a whole bunch of car people from all over to show up and sh uh, show our students what amazing things you can do. Um, and if anyone has a cool car or wants to come to see that as well, you can talk to me and I can get the paperwork out to you. We would love to have you there as well. And yeah, that's about it for today. All right, thank you, Rand. Thank you to everyone. All right, item 17, uh, anybody from the bargaining units here to speak? Okay, seeing none, we're gonna move on to 18, 18A, by trustee area election update. Uh, Harold Freeman, attorney with Lozano Smith, will be providing our board members with information on the upcoming 2020 election and census. Good evening, Harold, how are you? Good, thank you. Good, welcome. Thank you, thank you very much. It's good to see you all again. It's been a little while, and uh, I thought that whole big audience was here because people were finally interested in <laughs> voting and trustee areas, but no such luck. Um, we certainly didn't have large audiences when we were going through this previously, so I think it, it's still bigger than it was. Um, what I'd like to do tonight is just take you through a little bit of a reminder of where we've been and then chat about what's coming up next and a few of the questions that have come up and then really give you time to ask any questions I'm actually really glad you're doing this because a lot of the districts I've taken through this process have done it and then sort of put it on a back shelf and aren't asking these questions and thinking about it. So I appreciate the opportunity. Um, just as a, a refresher and a reminder, back in 2018, the school district received a demand letter uh, under the California Voting Rights Act to try to compel you to move to trustee area elections. And as you'll recall, the way the board has been elected historically is at large, where all board members are voted for by all residents of the, uh, or voting residents of Vacaville. We've moved on now to the by trustee area approach, which is where only particular areas, trustee areas vote for the trustee in their area. And you're about to go through that first election in 2020. Um, one just anecdotally point I wanted to make is that Back when I was talking to you about all of this in 2018 and we completed the process in late 2018, one of the questions that I think that came up was how many school districts have done this? Um, how many have moved over to by trustee area elections? And my answer to you at the time was about 13% in the state. A year later, by the end of 2019, it was up to 20%, which means about 75 school districts made the change during the 2019 year. Um, I've already personally been involved with two more that completed the process in January already. This is the trend uh, because the California Voting Rights Act really intends that this is a way that by having by trustee area elections that traditionally underrepresented groups have a greater voice in the election. And that's really the purpose of the California Voting Rights Act. Um, sometimes districts do this because they receive a demand letter more and more districts are starting to make the change simply because this is the trend around the state and where I really think we're headed. Um, so you were just a little bit ahead of the game. So with that, just to take you through where we've been, 
This map probably looks familiar, the um, by-trustee area map that the board adopted in November of 2018 and the County Committee on School District Organization approved in uh, December of 2018, which defines your seven trustee areas um, moving forward. It also lists the sequence of elections that will take place. Um, we discovered today in talking to your staff that when the maps originally went out, there is a small error on it, which is it shows trustee Malberg as being up in 2022 when she's actually up in 2020. And actually, since I even talked to your uh, staff today, I went back and tried to figure it out. And it has to do with the fact that the box got compressed a little bit because we had two names next to each other. And somehow the demographer didn't separate them back out again. It doesn't change anything that you did. The map that you adopted, the seven trustee areas, are based not on where the residents are of the trustees. It's the defined areas of election. And under California law, you didn't change the term of anybody who was sitting in the seats now. So it really, there's no consequence to the fact that that was noted. And in fact, it's hard to see. There's a little footnote there that says that the trustees' names are included only for reference. It's not actually a technical part of the map. So that's the good news on that front. So that map has been what's adopted. And I'll talk you through what will happen now in the November 2020 election with that map. But just as a reminder, um, this is just a, a quick breakdown of some of the demographics. What the board achieved by going to the trustee area maps is two different trustee areas that had a greater proportion of traditionally underrepresented groups um, that will be able to vote. So if you look at the, the lower chart, which is we call it CVAP, or Cal uh, Citizens of Voting Age Population, that's really what we look at when we're doing these numbers. Trustee area five, if you look at it, the uh, Hispanic or Latino voting total for that area is 33%. But by comparison, if you compare it to the district as a whole, that population is about 17%. So you, you've roughly doubled or close to it uh, the voting power of that particular group. And I always have to editorialize here and remind everybody this is not about the assumption that Latino voters will vote for a Latino candidate. It's to strengthen the ability of the Latino voters to vote for the candidate of their choice, regardless of race. Um, so it's not just about getting Latino candidates elected. It's about giving a, a larger voice to la the Latino population. Um, you'll also see on that same trustee area five that we've gone to now 33%, the African-American or black population there is 12%, whereas district-wide it's 8%. So again, you've increased that. Uh, and then in area four, if you look at the Asian Pacific Islander population, you'll see district-wide it's about 8%, and in trustee area four, it's about 13%. It wasn't possible, as you'll recall, to achieve the result of getting over 50% within one trustee area of one particular underrepresented group. It's just the way your district lays out. It couldn't be done, and California law doesn't compel you to get to that result. It's just moving towards that result. And I'll come back to that 50% thought in a moment. So just really quickly, this is the list of the trustees by area when they're up for election. Um, and you'll see that Malberg has been corrected on this particular chart and will be corrected on the website soon enough um, to just clarify that. And um, as you go through each of those, what you'll see is by trustee area, areas two, four, six, and seven are up for election in 2020. And areas one, three, and five are up for election in 2022 and I'll come back to this thought as well, that actually tracks what we have for the trustees in each area, but of course there's one area that has two trustees in it. And Trustee Malberg has, has uh, been tricky and moved from one trustee area to another. So there used to be one trustee area that had two in it, now there's a different trustee area that has two in it. And it actually got a little bit easier because of the move that was made. Because both of the people in trustee area seven are up for election in 2020. So we don't have a mix and match situation, which is where things get really, really complicated. Because does that mean that the person who was up in 2020 cannot run for office again because there's somebody already holding the office in that trustee area? That issue won't come up here because both are up in 2020, um, which is the good news. So just a couple questions that have come up that I wanted to address. Um, one is what happens when you have two trustees in one area? 
in this case, it's fairly easy because they're both up in 2020. If they both choose to run, they will be running against each other and anybody else who chooses to put in their candidacy. Uh, candidacy. And that is just the straightforward way it works. Again, if they were staggered and one was 2020 and one was 2022, arguably the 2020 position would have to be basically leave office at the end of that 2020 period, wait till 2022 to run again, but you don't have that situation. And we tried very hard to avoid that situation when we were putting the maps together with you. Uh, another question is what happens with the vacant area? So you have a vacant area right now that's up in 2020. The answer is gonna be somebody's going to be running from that area. Um, that is what happens when you've got the vacant area. But a follow-up question to that is what happens if nobody pulls papers for that area? And this is a question we get asked over and over again as we take districts through this process because there's always a fear. We don't have a trustee who lives there now. What's to say there's gonna be a trustee who runs now for that area? The really good news there is as many times as we've heard that, I, we've only had as a law firm, we represent about 400 school districts. We've only had one school district who actually had that problem come up where they didn't have anybody pull papers. All the others that worried about it, somebody pulled papers. And theoretically under the CVRA, what's now happened is it's easier for somebody to run for office because they're running in a smaller area. And so somebody who may have been discouraged because there was an incumbent that they'd be running against or because they had to basically uh, go district wide knocking on doors, they have a smaller universe now to deal with. And in our experience, anecdotally, we do find that that brings candidates out of the woodwork. Um, sometimes people you haven't seen. Um, but the flip side of it too is that you can always help encourage folks who live in that area to run. Um, for the district we had that was having trouble getting a candidate, they started having conversations with some of the school site council, some of the school uh, parental leaders that were there, uh, PTA representatives, and sometimes it takes a little recruiting to get somebody to run for that office, and, and so far it's been successful. In the chance that nobody pulls their papers, I just wanna briefly address what then happens because part of it's addressed in the education code, part isn't. What the education code says is that if nobody pulls their papers, it's called a failure to elect. That's the, the magic term of the education code. If you're ever bored at night and you wanna read about it, it's in elections code 5326 is the thing that calls it the failure to elect. Um, so with the failure to elect, nobody is run. When the candidate deadline has run and nobody has pulled their papers, the board gets a new magical power given to it, the school board, which is you get to advertise and say nobody pulled their papers for that area and invite people to apply and you get to appoint somebody to take that seat when the election would otherwise come up. So they would be seated that first meeting in December. Um, and so that's your first opportunity. But then the question is, what happens if you try that and nobody puts in for it? And that is a question that is unanswered. It is not addressed in the education code. It's not addressed in the elections code. So there's a great big we don't know because it just doesn't happen that often. It appears to us that what it means is you have to keep trying. So once the date of the election passes and you haven't appointed to somebody and you have a vacancy, you keep trying. Normally when you have a vacancy, if you haven't filled it, it goes to the county board and the county board gets to call an election which is an absurd result here because you had nobody pull their papers to run, so why would you call an election? So we think it's unlikely that that's the way that that would play out. Um, so I just kind of wanted to run you through that scenario. Again, it's just not cropping up in California where this has happened. Theoretically, your board could continue to function with only four members, which is just interesting tonight. Um, if you got to the point you only had three members because over and over again people weren't running, then the county board has the power to appoint somebody. Um, to fill in that extra space. Of course, they'd have to try to fill, fill the spaces from those trustee areas. So the real answer is if you're not getting people interested, board members, staff are welcome to go out and get the word out in that community and, and perhaps encourage people that you only have to campaign locally or if the deadline is run and nobody's pulled their paper, you don't even have to campaign. You just have to submit an application that you'll get to decide on. So that's just kind of running you through that process. And at the end, if there's questions about that, I'm happy to answer them. Um, what I wanna do now is just take you through the, the other piece of this. So you'll have an election in 2020 under the trustee areas. Um, the next one in 2022 for the remaining three areas, all seven technically exist. One of the, the things to always remember is that if you were elected at large, which all of you were, you get to finish out your four-year term. Once you're elected in by trustee areas, 
you are only allowed to carry out the term if you live in that area. So just to define that, we had one trustee that moved. If one of you moved now before the 2020 election or if you're up in 2022, you're still a board member in the district as long as you're in the district boundaries. If you move from one trustee area to another once your trustee area has had their election, so if in 2020 one of you is elected for a four-year term for that trustee area, you have to stay in that trustee area. If you move out of that trustee area, it's the equivalent of moving out of the district. So that's a, a fine little distinction. So just bear in mind if you're gonna move, now's the time to do it because uh, there's an election coming up. So what's the process that then happens? As you recall when we went through this before, it was a very involved process with five public hearings and a public hearing in front of the county committee and advertising in newspapers and on and on and on. As you'll also recall when we talked about it then when the 2020 census data comes out, from now on every 10 years you have to look at your map again. You can look at it more frequently, but at least every 10 years, and we're right on the verge of the 2020 data. So I'm going to walk you through what you need to do, and you can all take a deep breath because it's so much easier than the process you went through the first time, I promise. So with the boundary adjustment, after the census comes out, and I'll walk you through the timeline, um, school districts that have gone to buy trustee area elections have to consider whether they need to adjust their boundaries. So this would be an adjustment for your 2022 election. The data won't be available for the 2020 election. And you do that by looking at two statutory criteria. And I'll tell you right up front, if these statutory criteria are met, if you're okay, you leave your map alone. And there's a perfectly good chance your map will be fine and it will be left alone. Or if it needs adjustment, it will be a very, very minor adjustment indeed. It's rare that you'd have to completely redraw the map. So what those two criteria are that you have to look at, one is that all seven of your trustee areas have to be balanced by population. This isn't by citizens of voting age population. This is just how many people live there. Under federal law, under a United States Supreme Court case, you have to have balance between the districts or it starts to interfere with the idea of one person, one vote. Because you'll have one area that has a larger population that has one representative and another with a smaller one representative. It's a lot like Congress. Same kind of thing. You do it by population. So, so what they would do is they would look and see, are all seven by population still within 10% of each other? That's the standard, still within 10%. It's a 5% it's a deviation either way. So right now, the seven trustee areas you have were created to be within that deviation. When you go and look at this again, you have to see if you're still within the deviation. If you're not, you're going to have to play with the boundaries a little bit of the trustee areas. Usually, again, doesn't mean large with a drawing again. It may mean taking a few parcels, literally a few uh, voting blocks and moving them from one area to another. Uh, we won't know that until, excuse me, the population numbers come in. Where this is usually a big issue is in areas that have sudden large development happening. So if you have one area that's rapidly developing and another that isn't at all, you may see more of that, but you'll know more when that comes out. The second criteria won't be relevant to you. I put it up there just for your information. You have to look if the number of board members are still proportional to the number of trustee areas by population. The only reason that's there is there are other kinds of agencies that have multiple board members or governing members where they'll have multiple members in one trustee area. So that's just to look at that balance. You have one trustee per area for all school districts. That's the way it's done by law. So you don't have to worry about the second criteria. So all we'll be looking at is the population shift legally. And then there's some other pieces that you'll also want to look at. Um, the reason I say that um, legally, there, the other piece is that if you find out that the numbers have gotten so out of whack, because let's say that the Asian Pacific Islander population that used to be larger in Area 4, now is much smaller in Area 4, is significantly larger in Area 2, you have to at least give consideration as to have you unbalanced the effort to give a greater voting voice to underrepresented populations. Um, in this district and really under the CVRA, California Voting Rights Act, you're usually looking at the Latino population primarily um, as the, the, who the law is at looking out for on this. And so you want to see, is trustee area five still got a significant number of Latino voters that are in it? So that'll also be part of the review. You've already complied with the CVRA. You're done. And this is, that's all taken care of. Under the Federal Voting Rights Act, if it can be shown that you have a trustee area that could be 50% plus one, of one of these underrepresented populations and you elect not to move to it, 
it can open you to a challenge under the Federal Voting Rights Act, the FVRA. Um, I think it's unlikely you're going to go from 33% to 50%, but that's something you'll want your demographer just to make sure that you're not exposed there. So that's nothing to do with the CVRA. You're done with the CVRA. That's to make sure you're still in compliance with federal law as well. So then just quickly, the timeline as we go through this. So the census data in December 31st, 2020, the data is sent to the president for uh, consideration apportionment. They sit there and they analyze the numbers. Uh, thinking about it, December 31st, 2020, will be interesting to see who's, who's going to be reviewing that as we head into 2021, since we have a presidential election coming up. Uh, by March 31st, 2021, that information will have been digested, broken down, collected by the federal government and provided to the state governments. Demographers are able to get the data at that point. So that's your go time, is, is roughly March. Sometimes it spills into April of 2021. You'll want a demographer doing your analysis about how your numbers have shifted or changed. And then um, the other thing that happens, as noted here, is December of 2021, the public as, as a large will be given the data. California State will actually put out the data. You'll have it months and months before that through the demographer. Um, it just becomes generally available in December. So once you have all of that, you need a demographer. You need a demographer just like you did to create the maps to run through and analyze this for you. Remember that everybody who's gone to trustee area elections is going to need a demographer at exactly the same time. And there's only a certain number of demographers in the state. So we've already talked to your staff. Lining somebody up before March is a great idea because some of them are going to start shutting their door after a while and saying we can't take anybody else. And we've already had some discussions with staff to, to get that going. Um, the other thing I just mentioned, and it's up here, California law as of 2019 allows school boards, if you would rather have somebody else do this, to appoint a commission, I say here a committee, to do it for you. You can have what's called a redistricting commission. And you can have one of three different kinds of commission. You can have an advisory commission. They look at this data and they tell you, we don't think you need a new map, or we think you do, and here's our ideas. You can have what's called a hybrid commission. That's what the statutes call it. A hybrid commission is they narrow everything down to two or more maps and give you those maps to, to vote on. So you don't have to be worrying about putting it together. Or you can actually give it entirely to the commission and say, you guys pick a map and bring it to us and we'll approve it, whatever that map is. Um, whether you want to appoint a commission or not may depend on what that data looks like. If it's really controversial and difficult, you might want to have a working group that's working on this for you and consider it. So nothing you have to think about now but just an option I want you to be aware of for later. Um, this was, by the way, not an option that was available when you started your process. Um, that was not the law in California yet. The next thing that happens is the demographer performs the study. They're going to look at the data that we talked about um, and look at all of the numbers. And the bottom line is that if you meet that criteria that you're still population balanced, you can choose to be done. And particularly if the demographer comes back and says it really hasn't changed that ethnic or racial uh, distribution significantly in a way you'd want to revisit it, you may just be done. It's an automatic and you don't have to do anything else with it. Um, usually all you would get is a report from the demographer here in front of the board. You all nod and you move on. It's a very simple process. But um, if you have to keep going, if the numbers have shifted and you are compelled to redo the map, I want to take you through that. The first thing is, again, only if the boundary adjustment is necessary under that criteria, Remember all those hearings that we had and all the notices you had? None of that is required this time, virtually none of it. You also don't have to get the county committee's approval. You just adjust your map and you turn it over to the county committee and you're done. We do generally recommend have one public hearing, maybe put one notice in the newspaper, just so it's, it's a transparent process, but it's intentionally much more streamlined than what we did last time. It's faster, you don't have to have me coming to your meetings. Life will be good, it's cheaper, it's easier. Um, and at that point, you can decide for yourselves how much public participation do we want to try to get. Um, you can decide how many meetings you want to have. And ultimately, you come up with that map, uh, map adjusted as appropriate. The timelines for doing that is that you have to get that done by February 28th of 2022. So to remind you, March of 2021, the data starts coming out. You really have almost a year to have your demographer work through that and figure out what you want to do. I would not recommend waiting until late February of 2022 because it just compresses everything down towards the end and may make it rush. 
um, if you don't meet that deadline, so if your data shows you had to redraw your maps and you failed to do so, which isn't gonna happen, that's where the county committee steps back in again, and they're going to come back in and they're going to compel you to go through the process and that's gonna happen by the end of April. Again, something that's really unlikely to happen. Um, if the deadline is met, once you're done with your map, it goes to the county committee, that's not for approval. That's just so that they have it. Um, and it's really for their information. And then step five, the last step is once the map has been adopted and it goes off to the county superintendent, um, the adjustment to the boundaries have to happen 125 days prior to the next election. So I went back and I looked at a map. It always falls out the same week. It's the week of July 4th. I think for you it falls out around July 7th or July 8th of that year. Here's the little trick to know is that if you wait until July and you go to the registrar and the registrar of voters and you tell them here's our new map, every other public agency that has gone to trustee area elections, so your city council, um, there's others in the county that are going through the process right now, other school districts, they're all gonna hit it once and the county registrar is gonna say, I can't get this done in time. So you really want your process to be done by April or May, which means getting being a couple months ahead of this timeline through everything. Again, if your demographer says you don't need to do anything, it's even easier, you're just done with it. So that's the overview of where we've been and what's gonna be coming up with you for the next couple of years. Here's the, the famous slide. If you've got any questions, this is your chance. All right, Sean. Okay, thank you for the presentation, by the way. That's excellent. Um, so I just have a question because you know there's always got to be at least one naysayer in the room. So, has there been is anybody looking at the actual impact on local elections for this? In other words, this really effectively in a place like Vacaville can actually have the exact opposite effect of its intention, and can actually dilute voter voice uh, up to and including into representing groups. So. Is anybody really looking at that? Because I know everybody I talk to doesn't understand it yet because it really hasn't hit. And now understanding that they get one vote and not seven, yet all seven are making decisions of what's happening in their area. I mean, is there is anybody looking at that or trying to figure out how that impacts and maybe looking at potential adjustments to this? Because I have real concerns about the long-term impact of this on small local communities. Yeah, that right now most of the evidence is anecdotal. There are different institutes, including one out of a Southern California University that are collecting the data. One of the challenges that we have with that is that the CVRA was born in 2002, so it's not that old. The first 10 years of its life, people hadn't figured out yet that they could go around the state making demands on people and collecting attorney's fees, and to be really crass about it. So there were fairly few that made the change. Suddenly, starting around 2010, 11, 12, there was this rush and so we're just getting to the point where there's enough data to, to look at it. And it, all, again, all we know is anecdotal. We, I have a district I work with that has a very large Latino population and had only one Latino board member on a seven member board. They moved to trustee area elections and the one Latino board member was voted out of office. Uh, I work with another school district that had uh, an all Caucasian school board in an area that was in a district that was about 40% Asian Pacific Islander they had a, a vacancy and they appointed their first candidate who was not Caucasian. Uh, she was of Indian descent. Um, so she met the Asian Pacific Islander category. And then there was a referendum to remove her from office. And because of the size of the trustee area was so small, I think it took something like 50 people signing a petition to remove her from office. And they had an election in which she was defeated by a Caucasian candidate. Those are examples where the CVRA did not play out the way one would hope. We have, we have a host of other examples I can give you where there had never really been minority representation on the board, and after moving to trustee areas, there was a significant shift in the direction of, of minority candidates. So I think it's too, it, it's strange enough to say, I think it's too early yet to say how many have gone in one direction, how many have gone in another. Um, in my experience, for every one district, like the two examples I gave you, there's probably three or four that increased minority representation. Um, and we'll know, I think, probably after this next census, there'll start to be that data coming out. And I guess just, just my last question, and maybe it's just more of a point, but so there's no, at this point, the state of the law is still such that voters do not get the opportunity to vote on whether or not this is right for them in their community. I guess that's, at the end of the day, that's what always sticks in my craws. I don't think it should be the board making the decision. I think it should be the voters. And ironically enough, the voters themselves don't get a voice. Is, 
Is that still the case? And there's nothing that's at this point addressing that. Yeah, right now a school district by default does have an election as to whether or not to move to trustee areas unless you seek a waiver. And every school district seeks a waiver and gets the waiver, as yours did, from having the election, not only to avoid the cost, but the, the famous case was out of Glendale Unified School District. I talked to you about this a year ago, where they put to the voters whether or not to move to buy trustee area elections, and the voters voted it down. And the district was immediately sued, I think, the next day, because that was used as evidence of racially polarized voting. <laughs> See, this is what's stopping us from moving that way. So the district tried to let the voters decide. If the voters said yes, it would have been fine. The voters said no, and it was immediately overturned in court. Um, so we actually have been working with, the, with various different county offices of education to eliminate the election requirement altogether, if the legislature will, for school districts. Because cities don't have that. Counties don't have that. And yet you have to go and get the waiver from the state. So it's, if anything, it's moving in the opposite direction. OK, thank you. All right, Mr. Silva. Uh, good presentation. Thank you. Uh, I got a few questions. Um, uh, one, can we get a copy of the slides? Absolutely. Yeah, cool. <laughs> um, and then uh, two, uh, so you answered a, couple, a few of them, but um, how often, <clears throat> I'm, not a, I'm not advocating for this, but how often, is there any limit to how often uh, uh, district lines can be redrawn? There really isn't a limit. Um, as a practical matter, you're probably not going to do it more than once every two years right. for the election cycle, but in theory, you could do it. You could adopt one and six months later adopt one before the election even happens. You don't want to do it so often that you confuse the voters. Yeah. That's, that's the main key. So most follow that 10-year cycle unless there's been some other radical development. Thank you. Um, uh, one of them, actually, Sean mentioned, and I, I think it's, uh, or it's related to what he was mentioning, are there any, so this has been actually maybe more so for, for, the, for the board. Uh, so at the California School Board Association, this topic has come up at every meeting I've been in, um, and it doesn't seem to be a lot of information out there, so it doesn't seem like anybody's going one way. Um, and I just, I'm just, I'm, I just have a, a, a natural curiosity to see if what different ways are being implemented to ensure um, that a lot of the concerns are being um, are being addressed through through the policy or, or governing. So I don't know if you've heard of any ways um, that any policies or any practices that have been implemented to ensure that um, that voice the voices are being heard from each respective district. There, there really hasn't been. You know, the, the CVRA was written so you're supposed to have those multiple public meetings and an opportunity to pull in public input. Um, and that's, that's really what got baked into the CVRA. They tried last year legislatively to increase the number of how many hearings you'd have to have, and that didn't go through. So your school district would have had to have seven public hearings instead of five. Mm. But we all know that very few people came to any of those meetings. And, and so how the word gets out there to the public at, at large about this really is a very significant issue what you experience is what we typically experience, which is an empty audience as we go through and redraw these lines. And having to have more public hearings, I don't think is gonna change that, it's, which is why the legislature didn't make the change in the end. I, I don't have an answer for you on the right way to do it, other than CSBA is trying to educate its members, trying to get out there and get the word out. Limited, it's limited. Yeah. Um, cool, thank you. Um, is there a minimum number of board members? There, there is a minimum number of board members. So the default in California is five, unless you choose to go to seven. You can, with the county committee's approval, go down to three. So for, for a school district, unless you get special legislation, that those, those are the numbers. Five is the default. You can increase to seven. You can decrease to three. Okay. Thank you. And um, so uh, how, do, are you able to maybe elaborate more on the, the concept of primary residence? For people that have multiple homes or multiple res multiple homes properties yeah sure so in california for all california law this isn't just for cvra you're technically only have one primary residence and there's a whole test that's laid out by statute and case law about it is it's this the fancy legal words it's your primary place of repose which is a fancy way of saying it's where you sleep at night um, so if you have multiple homes within a district and there's one that you're sleeping in four nights a week that is going to be your primary uh, location. And, and it's not always an easy answer. Um, sometimes it's, it's really convoluted, but that's the basic rule. 
Cool. Um, that's it. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anybody else? Anything? With that, Harold, thank you very much for the presentation. Thank Always you. a pleasure okay. seeing you. We thank you for the information. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. All right. And with that, we're going to move on to 18. Oh, sorry. Quick question. Do we have to have a demographer? You have to have a demographer to analyze that data because the data that comes is, is in, raw, it's in the form of raw data. And it's going to be extraordinarily difficult and potentially open to challenge if you don't. The, the demographer's work is so much narrower than what you went through last time because they're really looking at, at one or two things. It's, it's not a huge job. So the good news is it's usually a lot cheaper than what you spent the first time around. But it's, it's legally you're not required to have a demographer. It's almost impossible to do this without one. But it's best practice. Yeah. All right, cool. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Good night. Thank you. And just lining up to give their presentation... Assistant Superintendent of Educational Op Options and Supports, Sasha Begill, and Director of Student Attendance and Welfare, Romero Barone, will provide an update on the multi-tiered system of support and social emotional learning update. Good Thank evening. you and welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, good evening, President the crowd Jameson. Goes <laughs> yes, the crowd is very excited. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Superintendent <laughs> Shamia and the board and our audience and members here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, we are going to be giving an update on our multi-tiered systems of support with a particular focus on social emotional learning this evening. Um, oh, is it in the PDF form or is it on the slideshow? I'll talk while they're getting yeah. it together. But um, the first slide that you're going to see is going to have a really a great representation, I think, of MTSS. And it's from the um, MTSS SUMS initiative, which SUMS stands for Scale Up MTSS Statewide. So I think they kind of stretched it on that acronym, but <laughs> we'll give it to them. Um, and that's from the uh, group that is leading a lot of the MTSS work in California. It's uh, largely funded by CDE and it's the office, um, the Orange County Office of Education, um, along with the Butte County Office of Education and a, the Swift Educational Research Firm. So a lot of the information around MTSS is coming from, um, from that SUMS initiative. And when we get to the graphic, um, you, you will see, you got it. I'm so difficult. I apologize. <laughs> Write that day, do? day down in history. She doesn't know how to do it. That, that is crazy. I've never heard that out of your mouth before. It's so embarrassing. Because she has demons. Do you want to just go to Google? Come on. Shark thing. Shark. Yeah. i doing that tonight when I go to bed. It's in the great Googly Moogly. Can I say something why she's doing that? No. Okay. <laughs> the floor recognizes Jane. Thank Jane. you. I wanted to acknowledge actually my administrative. Executive Secretary Teresa, she did, Teresa Flores, <laughs> she did all of the work around the map in the past two days, talking to Harold, figuring it out, cleaning up the website. So when Harold was speaking and saying staff, he really meant Teresa. Teresa. Mm -hmm. So I just want to acknowledge the incredible amount of work she's done around that. Great and job. did you fix it? Oh, thank you. <laughs> And with that, um, so here's the graphic that I was referring to, and you can see that under the MTSS umbrella is really the academic components, the behavior components, and the social emotional components of really serving the whole child. And that, that initiative and that work is going to take um, some layered supports as well, integrated frameworks, family and community engagement, um, and inclusive policies and practices. So I'm not going to go into detail on this slide necessarily with the, each of the three key components, but I think that that word there, inclusive academic instruction, inclusive uh, behavior instruction, and inclusive social-emotional instruction is really the cornerstone of MTSS. 
Um, and the themes that you will see in MTSS are those universal supports, um, regardless of what label students may come to school with, really being able to access uh, all of the systems that are in place at our schools. And so an example of this for us might be our mental health system, how we've kind of braided the funding and our mental health clinicians see whatever kid is needing to be seen. Um, so that's the kind of the concept. It's universal. Our supports that exist exist for all students. And sometimes you do have to be creative about funding um, and breaking down some of the previous barriers that were there to do that. Another example, of course, you saw a great presentation um, this evening from Browns Valley where Miro and I thought, well, maybe we should just skip ours because they did an excellent job um, of really highlighting some of these very components. And so their PBIS system, their um, the bear bucks, those, those universal systems where all, school, all children at the school have the opportunity to buy into a system and be part of a system. Um, and that's some of the great work that's happening through PBIS in um, the behavior arena at many of our sites. Another major theme are the data-based uh, decision-making, and this isn't just in regards to academics. So we've gotten pretty good, as many school districts have, at analyzing our test scores and looking for intervention based on how students are performing academically. But this also means reviewing behavior uh, data, how many referrals, again, back to the Browns Valley um, presentation, how many referrals are we getting? What does that look like? Where are our areas where we're having more referrals? Is it before lunch, after lunch, in the hallway, in the quad? Um, and so really looking at that data to make some school-wide decisions. And I think that we do have schools, as you saw today, um, engaging in that work already. Additionally, some of the social-emotional surveys that we have, so the California Healthy Kids Survey, or CHECKS, uh, the CSTS, which is the California Student Tobacco Survey, and of course our school climate survey that we give. And so we've gotten pretty good at being able to get some global data points and utilize those on a school-wide basis. And I think the next big step for us is being able to use individual student data in all three of these areas, so behavior, social, emotional, and academics, to be able to make database decisions um, for students on an individual level. So that's something we continue to work on. The other major theme is the development of teams. Um, and we have that. All of our school sites have an MTSS team. Many of them uh, started that process when they had PBIS teams. And they also have leadership teams. We have PLC, our, our learning communities. And so that's something that we also already have going in the district and we can continue to build on. And I think the important piece about MTSS is that it's a continuous process. And so it's not let's start over and scratch everything we've been doing and, and adopt this new system. It's really taking the systems that already exist and refining them, you know, really taking a deeper dive, looking into what, how is this working for us and adjusting as we review that data. And as we refine it, continuing to make one, one um, cohesive system where st all students' needs can get met. Um, and some of our schools are well on their way, um, and we have some really amazing things already happening within the school district. So I think that's an exciting piece to know, is that this isn't a start over or redo, it's really continuing to refine the things that were already um, well underway. So with that, one of the pieces that we did decide um, as a team this past year was that this year, one of the areas where we really needed to develop some more baseline knowledge was our social emotional learning. And so we've been focusing on that, um, and I'm going to have Romero talk with you a little bit about that. All right, good evening. So um, we had an opportunity this fall, five of us, to attend a um, conference in Chicago uh, that was uh, pretty much put together by CASEL. Uh, CASEL stands for the Collaborative for Academic, Social, and Emotional Learning. And at this conference, we gained quite a vast knowledge and, and understanding of not only what MTSS is, but really what social emotional learning uh, entails. So I'm really excited to share with you a couple of things regarding S SEL. The first thing regarding SEL is what is SEL? So I want to be able to uh, explain that. I also want to explain why does SEL matter and then how can schools promote SEL for our students. So SEL um, is pretty much the process through which children and adults acquire uh, and effectively apply the knowledge, attitudes, and skills necessary to understand and manage emotions, uh, achieve positive goals, and feel and show empathy towards others. And I think what we saw today uh, with Browns Valley's presentation really embodied what SEL is all about. So um, we were sitting there thinking, oh my God, like we should have just taken a picture of that and utilized that or a video of it uh, to explain what SEL is. 
Very excited to uh, share with you the five competencies of SEO. Um, I'm going to go through each one briefly. It's a lot of information, but I just want, want um, to mention that uh, the SEO competencies are really uh, inclusive to our skills that significantly correlate uh, success in schools, work, and in life. So we really want to talk about not just in school, not just the workforce, but really life skills. And so uh, the first one is self-awareness which uh, identifies emotions, self-perception, and identity. Second one is self-management, impulse control, stress management, self-discipline. Social awareness, which for us, perspective taking, empathy, which is one key word of SEL. Relationship skills, that includes communication, social engagement. And then responsible decision making. Uh, one of the things that I want to emphasize is uh, the different colors and the codes within those colors. So the uh, the two that are red focus on interpersonal skills related to self. So the two red ones are more about self. The two on the uh, two green ones uh, focus on interpersonal skills related to other people, and then the yellow one is really about focusing on responsible decision making, which is something that comes from within. What we have here is, well, what does that mean as far as our implementation of MTSS? And really, it's, um, you know, it's surrounded by the three main components of what happens in the classroom. And that includes what kind of curriculum are we utilizing? Uh, what is the instruction around SEO? What does that look like? And then what are the uh, school-wide practices and policies that we're implementing as a district um, in our schools to make sure that you know, SEO is, is a key component? And then how does that transition into our homes and communities? Because I think that's an, a key part of what SEO brings to the table. Okay, the answer uh, to the next question, which is why is SEO important? So science backs it up. Um, there's a lot of evidence out there that shows that um, with science um, has a, a great understanding of what students gain from SEO, and that includes better social emotional skills, uh, improved attitudes about self, positive classroom behavior, and then uh, science uh, and data has shown that 11 percentile point gain on standardized achievement tests. So it, it impacts what happens in the academics. It impacts what happens in the behaviors. And that's why SEL is a great emphasis and a great starting point for us through this MTSS work. Uh, it helps with fewer conduct problems, uh, less emotional stress, and then lower drug use, uh, which is something that has been shown um, through the research. And then it benefits adults too. And what we say is, you know, in order for our students to be SEL, um, as far as just be in a great state of mind, we need our adults to be in a great state of mind. So one of the things we're emphasizing as well is how do we include our teachers, our staff, to be inclusive of the SEL work, because they need to be part of that. Uh, we need to focus on them and bring those skills to our educators as well. Um, and this is pretty much uh, sums up what I was just expressing regarding you know what um, what is the impact that it has on the adults. And as we can see, when we surveyed uh, executives, they say there's certain skills that they are looking for. 92% um, of them uh, mentioned that t 10 of these skills, which are skills that fall right in hand with our uh, portrait of our graduate, which is an activity that you know we've been working on trying to get more information as to what exactly do we want our kids to graduate with, what kind of skills. And SEL embodies most, if not all, of the skills that we're focusing on. Okay, and so now is how do we implement SEL? I'm sorry, did I skip one? Oh, excellent. So um, how do we implement SEL? So for us, it's really about three main components. It's the implementation component, how do we improve, and then organize. So there's uh, really not a pattern that needs to be followed, but you know, step one always is building awareness and commitment. And that's really what we've been doing this year, just what is SEL, focusing on um, bringing in together the teams at each school site and be able to not only define what SEL is, but just what is SEL and what does it look like at your schools? Because we're all doing it. We just don't know it's called SEL. And so how do we enhance what we're currently doing to make it even better? Uh, and then strengthening, uh, strengthening adult SEL, which means, again, how do we um, make sure that our adults are working around that so that they can themselves help our students, uh, promote SEL for kids, and then practice continuous improvement. And that's really what it comes down to, is just once we get to a place where we have a deep understanding, we're seeing it in the classrooms. You know, uh, Dr. Dr. Shamia mentioned earlier the engagement component, and that's really what SEL also brings. And I think as we continue to elaborate and expand on that, uh, we're going to continue refocusing and reflecting on what else can we do to improve uh, around the work we're doing with SEL. 
So we'll talk a little bit more um, on these different focus areas of where we are currently as a district and what that work looks like. Um, so our efforts to create sort of an initial awareness and ownership at our sites ranges from you know, some of the trainings that we've provided as M the MTSS team to our site administrators that then they could take back to their sites and share with them um, in venues that were appropriate at the site level. And it also includes some of the work that we've been doing um, gathering them as a team Team and starting to really look at, well, what pieces are already on place in your campus? What teachers are you able to highlight and say, wow, they're doing SEL and they don't even know they're doing SEL, right? That teacher that has a group meeting every morning and talks about goals that we're going to set for our students. Those are all social emotional learning strategies. Um, and I think that get, getting the awareness built and un understanding of these things that we already do, as Ramiro said, fall under social emotional learning. So how do we um, ensure that we're getting that word out and helping to our staff and our teachers to build upon those current practices? Um, we've also been looking at our professional development needs. So what does that look like? Um, how much information do we need for teachers to be able, and staff, because this is really a whole school community um, type of endeavor, how, what information do they need to continue this work? Um, and then, of course, looking at, and where are we going to find that in our budgets, both at the site um, and then obviously at the district level, which will be part of the LCAP conversation. Um, the adult SEL component, I don't know if you remember two weeks ago when I did the behavior committee presentation, one of the themes that came out kind of over and over with that group of teachers and staff was this need for teachers and support staff to have social emotional support or to have mental health support. And I thought that was very telling. They were able to identify that need that they had um, and, and articulate that. And I think that is spot on. Um, we can't do for others until we first do for ourselves. And that's important to remember our teachers who are you know, just giving of themselves all day long in their classrooms and challenging and finding themselves in challenges with very intense behaviors or children who are coming to them with very intense needs. Um, and to be able to manage your stress, identify that you have stress around that, come up with a plan for how you're going to deal with it, and not personalize it, is critical in being able to manage that. Um, it's an important piece of teachers not um, having burnout and wanting to come back and being excited about being in the classroom. And so we've been focusing on that as well. Um, and I think really that the goal is to create a working environment where staff are supported, empowered, able to collaborate, and able to work with students so that they can develop their social emotional skills at the same time. Um, some of our schools, as you saw earlier, again, it was we didn't plan for Browns Valley to go this evening, by the way. That was just a happy coincidence. Um, but as you can see, some of our schools have just taken the leap already. Um, they're starting to work with different curriculums, which you'll also hear a little bit more about this evening. So it's kind of a great night for SEL. Um, Browns Valley is doing the Inner Explorer. And I think that it's nice that you know we didn't have to wait and lay all the groundwork. Some of the schools are starting to play with things, and that is giving the staff an opportunity to learn about SEL while they're doing it, getting comfortable with it, and really getting that buy-in and understanding of, wow, this is working for our kids. We might be on to something here. And I think that teacher we heard from earlier tonight is a great example of that. Um, and so, again, our sites are all in di different places, but are continuing to move forward and learn more about SEL and start the implementation um, process. So to kind of sum up, um, MTSS is really all about identifying strengths within our current practice. It's interrelated, it's intercon interconnected, and it's absolutely about continuous improvement. If you're doing MTSS correctly, you will never be done, right? Because our kids are changing, our systems should be responsive and changing with them. And so that continuous um, improvement, looking at data, refining our systems should be something that we're always doing. Um, some our next steps, we're going to continue this year with our social emotional learning and developing that baseline. And we're also going to start doing some inventories and taking a deeper look at our other practices and areas where we want to start prioritizing and working on a refinement in the system. And of course, um, as I said a couple weeks ago, this will all come down to how are we going to incorporate this and what are our priorities when everything um, is put on the table and what does that look like in the LCAP. Any questions? Anyone? Oh, there you go. 
Mr. Silva. Uh, thank you. Nice presentation. Appreciate you all staying for the big crowd. <laughs> <coughs> um, where? Um, so real quick, just uh, just have a couple questions. So what's the difference between behavior and social emotional? Because uh, when we start breaking down social emotional, it seems like a lot of behavior uh, issues are kind of tied directly to. Yes, and as I said, there it's all interconnected and interrelated, and so is engagement and your you know the academic piece. There there are all interrelated. So I would say behavior is um, typically the outcome or something that you might witness with a student. Um, Usually we are we see a behavior. Um, social emotional is really the ability to manage that behavior before it happens. So it's the feelings that I'm having. It's you know I'm getting nervous, and so what do I do about that? I recognize that I'm nervous. I have this strategy. I do my shark breathing. Um, I talk to a peer about my feeling nervous. Versus when when we don't have the social emotional learning and we have students have a skill deficit Behavior is often the outcome of that skill deficit. So I'm nervous. I have no skills I'm freaking out and now I'm running around the classroom. Does that help? Sorry. Yeah. That was a little dramatic perhaps <laughs> um, But that that's how mean. I like to think of it <laughs> Been there, right, so <laughs> I think that behavior is often the result of a, a skill deficit in our social emotional learning. Yeah, I think um, so. Some of the like concerns that I've heard in um, between even my own, within my own practice um, as a as a professor, uh, so even some of my classes, I try to in, uh, bring in uh, different skill sets, and I've had two instances in the past six years to where it just blew up, where um, the argument was, "You're not." You're not, you know, uh, I don't want to get into it, but uh, you're not, uh, basically both sides weren't feeling they were heard and just escalated. Mm -hmm. And um, mm -hmm. so it was like to the point where it was like, I'm gonna go back to old school stuff. So uh, yeah. um, so I, I guess, so kind of just going along those lines, um, like I, I love the idea of uh, restorative justice and I've been, you know, reading some more articles about, you know, that whole concept. Uh, I think with with the new laws and how, how we handle discipline mm -hmm. um, on what we're restricted to suspend, um, behavioral issues uh, with, with certain students. Um, are, are there any concerns or how, how will we go about uh, addressing the concerns uh, where we have um, teachers that are responsible to spend you know, 10, 15 minutes to resolve some type of issue while they also have a, a classroom you know, of 20 plus kids to, um, right. they need to still learn? Well, I think that, you know, that will be an issue, but I think that's one of the pieces. If we're spending five minutes a day working on our social emotional learning and building our capacity so that I can say, I respectfully disagree with the answer that you gave, and I would like to propose an alternative answer, um, right, which we might teach as an engagement strategy academically, but we're at the same time teaching these social emotional components where now as a student, I might not get in that altercation and you might not need to spend 20 minutes hashing it out between the two of us because we want to put in that proactive work. There will still be behaviors, um, and I'm sure we will have to handle them, but I think that that's, why, that's that interconnectedness, is that the idea that if we can teach the skills, then we might be able to avoid many of the behaviors that we're having, and certainly we'll address the behaviors that do occur um, and you know continue to work through that process, but I think that's that interconnected piece. So can I, I yep. just want to add in, Perfect. I mean, that's a good question, and it falls right in line with our presentation from earlier from Browns Valley. I had a conversation with Principal Benavides about their referrals and how much they've dropped. If you looked at the data, mm -hmm. and uh, I was asking what what can what is what tangible items do we have that we can utilize? Um, and she was saying how some of these SEL components are are partly responsible for this because they feel like some of the behaviors that were happening. The students are able to cope with it more. They're able to communicate. Just the example of the young lady who fell and had a bark all over. I mean, that could have been a behavior that could have resulted in something, but they worked it out. They did the shark breathing and, and worked. And so that's really where um, I think that the interrelated component, um, it, it comes into play. And uh, the more that it's being implemented and it's being implemented with fidelity, the more results we're seeing. And I think, again, just Brands Valley is an example of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of the challenges, um, and I've been through several equity, uh, you know, trainings that tie into this. Uh, for for a lot of us in the in the you know in the audience and and, and wanting to uh, uh, understand what equity is and wanting to address it in different ways, um, I think the the challenge is still how do we know we've actually achieved an equitable system, and 
and then when um so i think it's it's very difficult for people to say oh well you're never going to achieve it um i think that, i don't know it's a challenge on how we communicate that to um uh, to everybody that's involved involved um so i, I think um uh, so as far as the continuous improvement i'm just curious has there been any methodologies that uh, any systemic methodologies that you guys identify to to implement continuous improvement processes? So we haven't started necessarily that work, but there are a number of different um, inventories and uh, assessments that districts can take as well as schools can take. The PBIS also has some of these inventories and probably some of our sites that are f familiar and have been working in PBIS are familiar with that. And so there are um, lots, there's a lot out there, but I think that yeah. specifically for MTSS, absolutely there are inventories to be able to take a look at and usually you get together a district team um, with a variety of participants so we can really get a, a, a broad, oops, broad picture um, and then being able to look at that data and it will be you know you'll have to prioritize I mean we, I, we will always have needs we will always have areas that could grow um, and we could improve and I think the big conversation is I think first going to be identifying those and being okay to say mm, we could do that a little better um, and then determining which one are we going to prioritize to tackle first which one is going to benefit our students the most or really needs to happen for um, first in this sequence so absolutely Absolutely, there are our methodologies out there because we're so new in this process. We haven't necessarily done sort of the review piece yet, but that's one of the components that we're looking to do um, in the springtime is complete some of those inventories, start having those conversations. Cool. Thank you. Um, and last question is, you know, I have a lot of, a lot of educator friends that I have um, um, embrace more of a tough love approach. Um, does that fit into this in, in some way or in what ways? So I, I think the key word there is love. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's, and I, I've been, you know, and I've been in the district for quite some time and I've worked with some individuals like a Michael, Michael Van Hoy, um, who's an amazing, you know, educator, but he practiced tough love. And I think our styles were different, but I think the word love was, you know, definitely something that um, was part of the climate in the classroom, was definitely evident when you walked in there, the respect. And I think that it's, it's really about that con you know, connection and relationship, which I think that SEL brings out the most in, in people. It's not just about the fluffiness, for lack of better terms. Uh, it's really about how do we connect with our kids? How do we build our kids? How do we create empathy within each other? And then um, that family concept, you know, and carry them, carry that forward beyond the academics, you know, outside in the playground to the community and so forth. Cool. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. One second. There you go. Miss Nally, yes. I just think it's very exciting that we're they're doing this now, and. Um, because I know that teachers know in the heat of things when that child is running around the classroom or throwing things, um, that there's something behind that behavior, but it's very difficult to deal with when that child is doing that. Mm -hmm. And it's easy to take it personally. It's easy to see yourself as a failure as a teacher. Mm -hmm. It's easy to say, well, what am I gonna do about it? And so the backing up and teaching it even down at kindergarten where these children hopefully will come up through the system and by fifth and sixth grade have tools to recognize and that the teachers also can know that these children can learn how to deal with these behaviors before they become behaviors. Um, I think is it very exciting because I know, you know, having spent time in the classroom myself, it's very difficult when you care about the kids and you love them and you're nurturing and they are out of control mm -hmm. for whatever reason and so I think our teachers having the tools and also understanding that our teachers need not just support in the how-to, but that emotional support that goes with why isn't it working and how can I do better and not taking it personally because teachers love kids and they take it personally when they're not behaving. Yeah. So yes, all you. good stuff. Thank you for doing this thank work. Anybody else? All right. Uh, Sasha Romero, thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank all right. Great job. Thank you. Good job. Okay, 18C, Facilities Update. Chief uh, Facilities Maintenance Operations Officer Dan Banowitz will provide an update on current facilities. You're scheduled for 10 minutes. You have nine. Go ahead. I'll take 30. Thanks. All right. Um, Good evening, seconds. Board. President <laughs> Jansen, Superintendent Schmia, I am here for your facilities update. We're going to start with Markham. We are uh, really excited that um, 
We are opening up the first 13 classrooms. Um, they will be in class on Monday. Um, we have been working on, uh, you know, the contractor um, landmark has done a great job moving forward. We're, we're a couple weeks ahead of schedule for this. Um, we, but, you know, we're always we're coming right up to the end. So it was paving on Tuesday, moving furniture in on Wednesday. We opened the classrooms up today after school for the first time to the teachers, and we'll do it again tomorrow. Uh, the move of all the rest of the contents will happen Saturday morning. And then we have a ribbon cutting Monday at 8.30 a.m. Um, at the site, and they will be in class for their first day on Monday in those new classrooms. Okay. Then they'll start the process of getting rid of all the portables that they have emptied. So there's going to be some that will be demolished, and there's going to be some that are going to be picked up and moved and stored for um, maybe other purposes. Uh, Zanino Stadium, we're taking advantage of the good weather that we're having here now. Um, and hopefully it stays that way. We keep track of that as the weeks come out so we can see if we need to accelerate things. Um, and we are as always evaluating the need for overtime and that type of thing because we're on such a tight schedule for this one. But we're looking at how we can take advantage of this and we're doing things to change the sequence of how things can be done. For example, putting the first layer of um, asphalt where the track would be to help us, even if it rains a little bit and the rain goes away much faster and then we're not delayed with the, the dirt and everything when we get that field and turf in. So we're looking at everything that we need to look at to make sure that we are done May 18th. And that's the schedule on that. Um, Sierra Vista, uh, you know, we've been working con construction at Sierra Vista for over two and a half years. From the reopen to the science classrooms to the MP room and now the library and the final uh, work in the administration building. And we're finally coming close to an end. Um, we are going to be, we finished the back end of the admin building. We're going to be moving the uh, administrators and the secretaries back there on Saturday, February 8th. And so we can accomplish the work in the front half of the building. We are going to be done by April 10th. So we've got just over about a month, two months left to go um, to get that wrapped up. And the outside, if you've driven by there lately, you'll see that there's no scan on the, um, on the new library building because we've got that wood rot that we've been dealing with that uh, we have uncovered that. Um, so we have that being dealt with and, and recovered and then the new sign, um, the new sign coming. Um, but we're getting closer to finishing out there and finally being done with Sierra Vista. Um, our next uh, COC meeting is going to be on February 12th at 6 o'clock here in this building. Um, we have uh, typically once a month except for July and December and when we meet with the group. Some of the smaller projects that we're working on are the security cameras that you approved a couple weeks ago um, at 343 and 353 Brown Street are already being installed. Um, they'll be done by next week, and then we'll be up and running there. Um, and the, one of the other things you've passed recently was the Wilsywood Theater um, heat and air conditioner, the 2010 unit on top of the theater. Um, it is, you know, we're looking at spring break to get that thing hoisted up there and, um, and get that one replaced. Okay. Um, and on a maintenance side, one of the great things is the first round of trucks that you approved, the first five trucks, they arrived today. Yeah. Um, so now the politicking is all happening out there with the guys. You know, I, I deserve that, that truck, and I deserve that truck, and I've been here the longest. And so yeah. I'm letting William deal with all that. But um, we're going to get those things in our inventory and our insurance and our stickers on them, and then we'll get them uh, passed out. The five that we're going to take out of service for a sell that money that we sell that with will go into for the next round of trucks in, in July. Okay. Any questions? Uh, yes. Shelly? How are the teachers going to unpack their stuff? How are the teachers going to unpack well, that's, their stuff? Well, that's why we were allowing them to come in today and tomorrow. The, the, the stuff, what they need to get ready to have for the first day of school, they're doing today and tomorrow. And then um, we'll do the rest of the, 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 the rest of their items um, on Saturday, and then they'll be free to come in over the weekend as well. But I wanted to give them some time before the weekend as well to, you know, put things on the walls and, and really cut that time of being ready to go. So they all, they've been informed, you know, they should, you know, Jose was really, was really good about saying, hey, your, your Monday, Tuesday curriculum should have ready to go in a certain thing so you can have it ready. Wow. I mean, like, the books are going to be in boxes and all that. Yeah. They're going to have to undo that all themselves? Uh, well, yeah, they, they do. We move everything in there. We help them as much as we can. We have movers on site that when they're there over the weekend, we'll see, you know, they can, we'll roam around the rooms after everything's moved. They get the guys roam around and say, they go, oh, you know what? I want this over there. I want this over there. They'll 
do all that stuff for them. But they don't unpack books and put them on the shelves or anything like that. No. So there's a lot of work. To it. I, I just want to add something as a parent of Markham. Mm -hmm. uh, our teachers are amazing. Excuse They've me, been, sir. Who are you? I don't know who this guy is. <laughs> as a parent of our teachers have been amazing at Markham. They've been sending out messages, including parents. So a bunch of us are going right. today and tomorrow uh, to help after school and, and just, you know, um, be moving. So I, awesome. I love the community aspect of that. Good. So um, I'm looking forward to I worry about them. I know. I know what that's like. <laughs> been through it. You can go out. And then the next round of classrooms will be done. Um, we're looking at them being completed over the summer. So then we'll be able to, you know, they'll have more time. This one is just getting those ones in there. We, and we really, by doing it now, then we, it's, we're faster getting those portables out of there that they're vacating. And then we can get those other classrooms in faster and we can get this done sooner. And where are they so. going? What's that? Sorry. Where, Turned it off. I did it again. Yeah. Where are the portables going? Uh, four of them are being demolished because they're just not worth, we're not sure they would make it on the road if we moved them out. The, the other nine are going to be stored at Elmira. Um, so I've been working with them to be able to store it out there until we figure out what we're going to. And it kind of gives us some time to to decide you know, what and where, and, and that will be talked about in, on February 29th. Stop by and say hi. Yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? Thank you, Dan. Thank you. Appreciate Thank the update. You. Yeah. All right. 19 consent calendar. Uh, Dr. Shamir, we have any changes? Yes. To the consent calendar? Um, I'd like you to pull 19 R, the character strong curriculum. So 19 R. Okay. You, so I uh, we'll would look for a motion to pass the rest of the consent calendar minus 19 R. So there's a um, motion by Mr. Silva, second by Mr. Wyndham. Uh, all in favor? Yes. Motion passes unanimous. Um, so then we'll go to 19R. Yeah, I'd like to ask Mr. Santa Padre to come up and introduce a couple of amazing teachers that are going to share about this curriculum. And, and thank you and for hanging in late. there with yes. us. <laughs> Good evening, Ed. Good evening, President Jansen, board members, Superintendent Chimea. I um, love the theme tonight with the social emotional learning, and we're going to continue it. I, I'm not sure we're going to see a lot of shark work tonight, but um, we are asking you to approve the next um, level of the Character Strong curriculum, the Character Strong leadership. And so we asked um, Tracy Ruiz from Wilsey Wood and Justin Bassey from Vacaville High School to come and just share a few examples of how they've used the Character Strong curriculum. Good evening, Tracy. Good evening, Justin. Hello. Hi. Welcome. Uh, well, we've been using Character Strong in our advisory uh, implementation this year. Um, they are short, small uh, lessons packed into a kind of a small period of time to kind of, as they were presenting the SEL uh, presentation, that wheel that had all of those little colors on it, that's exactly what Character Strong is, um, almost to a T. Uh, the lessons are direct. Um, they are interesting, they are thoughtful, um, they don't feel too touchy-feely. At the same time, they are um, really good. Um, we've been doing this since uh, August, we have implemented it. Um, and the other thing that I really like about it too is that it's diversified in that there's a ninth grade track, a 10th grade track, 11th and 12th, so it's not the same thing. While the topic is the same for all four grade levels, the activity is a little bit different, so it's very age appropriate. Um, and it's, it's, it's good stuff, we like it a lot. And we, we are just starting to do the advisory, too, uh, at our school at Back High. Um, but in some of our health classes and our other classes, we've been doing a lot of their kind of character dares, which uh, challenge the kids by choice to, to improve their character, whether it's, you know, leaving a note for somebody, uh, calling a family member, visiting an elementary school teacher um, that they haven't talked to in a long time. Uh, we've been doing that for a few years now. Um, but a lot of the lessons, and there's staff stuff. There's, there's mm -hmm. things that we can do with the staff to encourage them to, do things that are very nice to, to, to each other. Um, and, you know, getting some stuff from back from the kids at the end of the semester, uh, you know, at first they, they do feel that maybe it is uh, awkward because it's because it's making kindness normal again. But at the end of the semester, this was the stuff that they talked about the most, the things when we got to handshake or high five or meet new people or get up and move around. Um, and and their, their work is so easy. They talked about how their, their teachers – read the materials that they did and made sure that this was something that all teachers would do. It's not something that they would, um, 
you know, never do in their classrooms. It's just stuff that's been practiced. Look at it in 30 seconds and the lesson is ready to go. Um, and the kids get to engage and have fun with each other while embedding their education for whatever subject matter that they're covering. So it's history, it's math, it's health, it's English. We can do it in all classes. Give me a perfect example. Last week's lesson was real life honesty. Um, it broke the, broke the character trait of honesty down into a couple of different definitions. And one of them that st teachers could kind of play with it any way they wanted to. Um, but one that stuck out for me was the idea that honesty is holding people accountable for their actions. Um, and we had an incredible discussion in my junior uh, advisory class about, well, what do you do when your friend is making bad choices? When they are hanging out with people they shouldn't be hanging out with, maybe involved in some substance issues, um, or not coming to school, or not doing their work, like, how do you have that honest conversation? What does that look like? Um, how do you do that without making people angry? What is it okay to make people angry? Um, so that idea, it's discuss discussions like that. Um, my next door neighbor in my classroom is uh, Mr. Mike Humphreys, and Man, he, the bell didn't ring and he was in my room going, oh my God, we had such a great discussion today. Uh, so they are bite-sized lessons um, that can be of high interest um, and they are direct instruction in character building um, and challenges as well. So it's, it's really good stuff. The leadership portion, which is I believe what we are asking you to uh, approve, is kind of an extension of that. Um, I thought it already was approved, but apparently it's not. So, uh, <laughs> but the, the, the stuff that they do is really good stuff. So I'm excited to finish this year off and to kind of start all over again as well. I have a question. So yes. the addition of what we're going to be adding here is the leadership portion. Is that now teaching them to be leaders it, on top it, of just yeah. good people, what you've been doing already? Yes. Yeah. Um, and it can be used in leadership classes. It can be used in kind of any class. I think it's more geared toward the leadership classes. Um, I was looking at it when I was teaching leadership in terms of like, that would be really good stuff. Um, but it's kind of more of an emphasis on that as well. Okay. I just wanted to say you you two are awesome yes. <laughs> and, and thank you so much for staying and, and sharing this and I'm going to come by soon and observe it because it sounds it's good awesome stuff. It's, yeah it's good stuff. I really want to see it it's good stuff it's fun so, for the teachers to do thank you. as well like we get engaged and it's fun to do so yeah yeah it's good any other questions all right awesome. well thank you Tracy thank right. you Justin thank appreciate you. it thank you. yep nice job all right, so we have uh, one item left to approve, and that's the approval of the new high school course, Character Strong Leadership. Do I have a motion? I'll second it. I have a motion uh, by Mr. Windham, a second by Mrs. Daly. All in favor? Yes. yes. Any opposed? Seeing none. Passes unanimously. And we have informational items. at supplemental instructional material for the middle school science consideration. Um, the secondary leadership team has approved the submission of this instructional material for the board consideration. It is uh, recommended the adoption of a as supplemental instructional for the middle school science. It's uh, Autodesk Tinkercad, Autodesk software, copyright 2011. This is a free digital platform, so there is no funding required. Future business, we have a regular scheduled board meeting on the 13th of February, a special one on the 29th of February, and back again for a regular one on March 5th. Seeing mo no more, we are adjourned. Yay!